Last Sabbath, we looked at uh, a couple of different things regarding the Beatitudes, and the last part was how the Beatitudes fit in with the fruits of the Spirit, and that's a part of how we work out our own salvation. And I referenced the somewhat troublesome scripture for some people in 1 Corinthians 9, so I wanted to kind of talk through that today. And you can see in entitled this first message, Becoming All Things to All People, which is a part of that message, or that scripture, I should say. One of the things that comes a part of the cultural Christianity's views of salvation that, quite frankly, we should disagree with because it's wrong, is that now is the day of salvation. And I, I put this on the screen not to criticize from the standpoint of being mean-spirited, only from the standpoint that if you go on Billy Graham's Evangelistic Association, of course, you know his son, Franklin Graham, runs that as well as uh, one of the philanthropic organizations, uh, Samaritan's Purse, they will tell you that today, this day, this time is the day of salvation. But they're not the only one. Most of cultural Christianity believes that to one extent or another. In fact, um, one group called Seek and Save the Lost, and these are titles that come off their websites, as today is the day of salvation, and they capitalize the. But we understand that even among many sects or denominations of what cultural Christianity has around us, there's this idea of salvation, which is the saving of a human being from their sin and the consequences of their sin, because that sin would result in death, and ultimately death from the standpoint of being a separation from God, and that the only way that that can be remedied is through Christ's death, his resurrection, and justification that would come as a part of salvation. And when we think about that, that's not necessarily all wrong, but there are variant views of salvation, and there is a terminology that's used in many theologians' vocabulary regarding what that word is, but it, it goes to a great extent along the, the major fault lines that divide a lot of denominations regarding the definition of sin. What is sin? Well, if you do away with God's law and that it doesn't have to be kept, then really what sin are we talking about? And that is a problem because we know from 1 John that Sin is what we have listed for us is the breaking of God's law. And when you do away with it, then again, what sin are we talking about? And that leads to a whole lot of argument and discussion. Then there's argument and discussion among cultural Christianity of what is justification and what is the actual atonement of sin. And again, when we think about it, I don't know that it's incumbent upon us to understand everyone's ideas in cultural Christianity, as much as it's probably more important to understand what's in Scripture and what do we need to understand. If you have your Bibles, turn over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And for many of, of you who have been a part of uh, a culture of, of, of the past in the church of God. This was a scripture that was quoted many times. It is the actual words that Jesus used when he's having a discussion with the Jews at the time regarding, you know, his calling and what he came to do. But in verse 44 of John chapter 6, Jesus makes the statement, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. And of course, we see in this, when we read it, with the understanding of the resurrections, we see resurrections mentioned here, and we see that not anyone can unilaterally make a decision to come into the relationship for which salvation would occur unless the Father drew them. No matter how much effort an individual puts into it, no matter how much reading they put into it or theological understanding they obtain through seminaries or whatnot. The point of the message here that Jesus is saying is that 
an individual through their own human intervention cannot come into this relationship unless the father allows it. And the father draws that individual to Jesus Christ. And that is something very, very different from what cultural Christianity teaches. And the individuals who propagate that today is the day, not a day, but the day of salvation. Just like you have some churches of God who say they are the church of God, not that they are a church of God. And that exclusive nature leads them to be very vain about themselves and arrogant about themselves. Because if you don't attend Sabbath services with them, then you are not with the church. And that is something that many of us have come out of in the course of time. But unfortunately, some in the churches of God still preach that exclusiveness. And that's wrong because Jesus even references he had sheep that others did not know about. And they many will look at that and say that's Gentiles, but you can also look at it from the standpoint of he's working in a lot of areas and he doesn't require necessarily that any one organization be the only organization for which he can work. He's not that hand tied. But the point of John 6 44 we see is people cannot come to Christ strictly on their own initiative. The Father has to draw them. Now, in the same chapter, if you'll turn over to verse 59, there's an interesting discussion. And of course, this goes back to Jesus in the previous verses, making reference to the fact that he's the bread of life. You have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And we, we talk about that around the time of the Passover. We talk about that in relationship to the deep relationship that that creates when we partake of that. And we understand what we're doing in symbol through the Passover. And we have no part with Christ if we don't partake of the blood and the, and the form of the wine and the bread in the form of the flesh. And that is very key important because he clearly states, if you don't do this, you have no part with me. And yet most of cultural Christianity doesn't even keep that. But he has, I think, a very another interesting comment to make in this dialogue in verse 59 with his own disciples. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious of his disciples grumbling at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then? If you see the Son of Man ascending to where he had, was before, is it the Spirit who gives life, the flesh, profits nothing? The words which I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But these, or rather there are some of you rather, who do not believe. So he noticed among even his own disciples a lack of belief. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were and who did not believe, as well as who it was that would betray him. And here's the interesting comment. And he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless the Father grants him. And that's an important, again, stipulation that has to be a part of this calling and election. Coming to Christ for salvation is never merely just our human achievement. No matter how much we may want it, and we hear people on in cultural Christianity make great pleas for people, and we see people who somewhat could be very sincere in what they say they're doing. But unless the Father is a part of the calling and is a part of the drawing and is a part of the granting, it's not going to happen. Or if we believe it will happen, then we're calling Christ a liar. Which one is it? And that's something I think that is, is very different. Now, when we think about these scriptures, we think about, again, as I referenced earlier, the connection between belief and the different resurrections. Jesus includes an, a segment here in verse 65 of belief. 
or for 64 and 65, I should say. And the belief is, is as well a part of what the resurrections are. And it's crucial for the understanding of what we see in Pentecost and what we see in the Feast of Trumpets, because there are uh, these are festivals that symbolize physical and spiritual harvests. And we see one very small and then we see another much larger in nature. And there's and this was a, a, a bit of a parallel that Jesus used, obviously, to help them to understand in ancient Israel, as well as in the, the agrarian society of the, the society before ancient Israel. When we have people like Abraham, when we have people like Enoch, we have others who would obviously have had to have had some understanding of what it was God was doing and working in his plan of salvation. So I say all of that to come to what we've referenced earlier, and that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So if you'll turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, some would say that this particular verse or, or segment here is referencing the fact that we can save other people. We can do it. Leading this idea of this is the day of salvation, leaving to the calls that go on in many Protestant churches for people to give themselves and their hearts over to the Lord and, and everything that goes along with that, if you've ever seen or been a part of that. Beginning in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 9, the Apostle Paul makes a statement. He says, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who were under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, though not being without the law, but made, but rather under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak, I became weak so that I might win the weak. And I have become all things to all men, so that I may be all re so that I may by all means save some. And you, you, you read that just on the surface, and as many people do, and they begin to make theories. And theories develop into doctrines, which develop into theology. That meaning that they can win people to salvation and win people to under and Christ's relationship, which would be a complete contradiction to what Jesus himself said in John 6. Who's doing the saving? It's interesting when we read through that segment of scripture, Paul references five times this idea of winning people, different types of people. And then finally, he comes in verse 22 to talk about saving some, not saving all, saving some, which is a bit of, you know, when you think about it, even along the lines of what we'll get into when we start digging into the meanings of these words and what Paul's really saying, he's not even saying that now's the only day of salvation, yet cultural Christianity says it is. And, and, and if you don't accept Jesus Christ now, you're going to burn in hell. And much less those individuals who have been never knowing Jesus Christ. So you send missionaries into Africa and, and, and Asia and whatnot. And if that idea is true, then there's been untold numbers of billions of lives that never even knew about Jesus Christ and have no hope of salvation. If this is the day of salvation. The, the interpretation fits, as I said, a lot of the general evangelistic beliefs that some hold in today's society. And when you think about it, this idea of winning souls for Christ is a bit vain. And there are some in the churches of God who think they can win people over through their witness. And that is of the same vanity as well. And we need to be careful with that. You know, again, only as a form of reference, I go back to the scriptures that we just read in John chapter 6, that Jesus referenced himself. The Father has to do the drawing. The Father has to do the permitting. 
Otherwise, it doesn't work. Now, you can make an argument that people understand a little more about the person of Jesus Christ and they can read words. Yes, that's true. But what we're talking about is what Jesus was talking about, entering into that covenant special relationship that requires the eating of the bread, of the flesh, and drinking of the blood through the wine. That's a different ball game altogether, using an analogy. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. An, a very interesting statement is made here as well. And verses 44 through 49, just to kind of set the context, Paul and Barnabas have gone out. They've gone out into the synagogues as a part of their commission through the Holy Spirit. And they start talking to the, the individuals in the synagogues, the Jews who were typically there, or the God-fearers who happened to be in there as well. And they begin to see resistance from those who were under the law, the Jews. And so it says in verse 44, the next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and began contra contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it is necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, speaking to the Jews, since you have reputed it and judge for yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, if I placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So is Paul saying that he is now saving people? When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. Don't let that little phrase go by without you just understanding as many as were appointed. In other words, the Father had drawn certain individuals and the Father had permitted certain individuals and only those for which it had been appointed to offer to them this invitation, this calling for salvation or eternal life, those were the only ones that believed. It wasn't everyone in the crowd. It was only the ones for which it had been done. Now. Could the individuals who heard, and maybe the father had not drawn or the father had not permitted, obtained any value from it? Absolutely, they could. But God chooses. Why he chose you, why he chose me now, I really don't have a good answer. All I can say is thank you. And let me make the most of this, of this choice now, an opportunity. I've heard individuals in the churches of God over the course of time make a statement. And I wish I had been called in the second resurrection. It'd be a lot easier. True. It probably would be a lot easier if Satan's not around to help entice us and influence us to sin. But the point of the matter is, now is our time. It's irrelevant. Other than the Father has drawn you to Jesus Christ, he has permitted you to enter into an opportunity. The door's open. Walk through it. Don't shut it yourself. And I think this point here is, is something that the Gentiles, he was opening up the door. So it's not Paul who is the individual who's offering salvation. Notice that it is the Lord and the word of the Lord. And as many as it was appointed, as we would say, looking at John 6, the father allowed, then those were the ones who believed, not everyone. And it says here in verse 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region. So God was now working and opening the door to the Gentiles, to individuals that he was choosing, like Cornelius. And Cornelius accepted. And Cornelius went through the door, so to speak, as we might say. And he began to live his life in a different way, the way that you and I are to live. 
Let's turn over to John chapter 17, a very familiar scripture that we read around the time again of Passover. And in verse 3, Jesus is making this prayer to the Father, and he says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. That is the way through which we can have salvation. It's not through any other name, as Paul will later reference. And, you know, I, I, I remember hearing individuals in the past making statements that, oh, yeah, in the kingdom, or not the kingdom, in heaven, there will be good Baptists, and there will be good Presbyterians, and good Catholics, and good Jews, and, and you know, you hear all of that, and, and, I mean, it sounds good. And it's far be it for me to even try to put limits on God or any of us to put limits on what God can do. And you have this whole scenario with the individuals on the stakes beside Jesus Christ. And one, Jesus says, tomorrow you will be with me in paradise. And, you know, the, the individual, apparently, Jesus was able to look into his heart and make a decision. And he's going to make a decision on all of us as well. And we're not the ones to make the decision. We can make a decision of whether we're going to believe, whether we're going to continue, whether we're going to accept the call and the invitation that's been given to us at this point in time, or whether we're not going to do it. But that is our portion of the free moral agency in all of this. But we understand that even with the oftentimes called in cultural Christianity, the missionary efforts of Paul, the missionary efforts of Barnabas and the missionary eff efforts of all of the um, early apostles in the church, that they were winning souls to salvation. They were only a, a, a tool being used, but it was the Father that was drawing people. The Father permitting the permission that had not been happening before then on the scale because of the agreements that had been made in the covenants with Abraham. And then when they decided to reject the one that would bring them life in the form of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, then the door gets open. Not to say that it was never the plan to open it all to salvation to all kinds, all Gentiles, because it was. But there was an order. And we, and we see Paul make reference to the Jew first and then the Gentile. And, it's, and, and we see him even make the reference to Esau and, and Jacob, and he makes the comment even with Isaac and, 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 and Mishael. I mean, you, know, you think about it. He makes the choice, and we can't argue with it because he has a far greater plan than we have minds to comprehend. Now, there's some scriptures that I have here that I'm just going to reference. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that of not of yourself. It is the gift of God. So it's not our human achievements that will give us salvation. In fact, our, air quotes, achievements will get us death because of our sin. We can't do enough good to reverse the bad that's already been done. It's only going to be through the belief and through the grace of our Father in Jesus Christ and his and Jesus Christ atoning blood that we will ever be able to be given that gift. When we look at 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 2, the apostle Paul makes reference to the fact that not all have faith. And he's talking at that time. Not all of humanity has faith now. And there's even the idea when we look at several parables that Jesus gave that even certain virgins will have to go through problems because of their faith, while others may not. What about Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23, when Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. And these people will even talk about performing miracles and healings in his name. And he said, yeah, you use the right name, but you weren't called yet. And so we see that the calling the granting of the permission is extremely important for the success of the salvation. And it's not humans involved as far as making the call. 
Acts chapter 2, verse 39. Of course, this is very familiar when we think about Pentecost and we think about verse 38 of Acts 2 when it talks about repent and receive the Holy Spirit. He also says in that same segment of Scripture, for the promises to you and to your children and to who all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call, which is oftentimes not even talked about in cultural Christianity. But it's only as many as God will call. And God will have a smaller harvest and then a much larger harvest. He will not leave uh, uh, anyone outside of the opportunity, but the timing of the opportunity is not all today. And that's the part that cultural Christianity misses. They miss it by a mile. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That is what our calling is, is into that fellowship. We can't make it into that fellowship unless the Father grants it and the Father draws it. Jesus said it, and even the Apostle Paul says it to the Corinthian church in chapter 9. And, you know, when we think about our, chapter 1, verse 9, when we think about, again, this problematic scripture that's given that we read earlier in 1 Corinthians 9, you go back to those words. The word when, and I have what that word is in the Greek and the, and the reference point in Strong's Concordance. It means to gain. And to gain means to acquire through effort or investment. Uh, as a part of whether you can earn it or make a profit from it, it can also be used in that terminology as well. But it's the same word that's used in Matthew 18, 5, when he talks about if your brother offends you, you go to him and you, you talk to that individual. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. You've won your brother. You've won the relationship. And it's the same identical word that the Apostle Paul's talking about when he's talking about winning all these classifications of people. And this gaining is about winning, not winning someone for Christ as it is gaining a better relationship. with people. And here's the thing. The Apostle Paul is talking about having a relationship with people for which you're not offending people so that if God's going to call someone, then you can be a tool like Paul was in order to help that individual if God's calling towards that better relationship. That's a part of this gaining that Paul's talking about by looking, again, at the definitions for the words. And there's another aspect of it, too, when you're talking about gaining or winning. It, you know, it's, it's striving to improve a personal relationship with an individual so that, again, if God is a part of this, then you might be a, a, a vehicle by which the person can develop that relationship. But no matter how nice and good we are, if God's not calling, it's not going to happen as far as a relationship with the, the Son. It only will occur if God's doing the calling, or the Father's doing the calling. So this gaining is not something of converting people or even opening their minds. God does that. You don't do that. I don't do that. No matter what your witness may be and what you think you're doing, you're not converting anybody. The Apostle Paul wasn't converting anybody. Only the Father will allow the words to be spoken and then work to make that work within the heart and make the person change. You can't do it. I can't do it. We may plant a seed if we use the word rightly and we have the right relationship and we're not offending people. But while we can stop something from happening, we cannot make it happen. And I think that's important for us to understand. This gaining is not about winning people for Christ, but about building a better relationship. And if the Father chooses to work, then he has the ability to work and provide the win. When you think again about this saving and this winning as well, the word save means to make safe. And it's a basic process by which, even when you look through the entire uh, section that this scripture is in which if you go and you read all of 
1 Corinthians 8 all the way through to chapter 10, he's talking about the ability to deny yourself of things that, yes, are lawful for you so that you don't cause a brother to stumble. You know, you may have a situation where you know, I had a situation this past week, a traveling companion that was a part of our entourage going to our business meeting, she let us know up front that she was a vegetarian. And she had asked for certain dietary parts of what our meals were to not be meat-based or whatnot. No one made fun of her. No one said, you know what, you're just silly for that kind of reason. It's all accepted and allowed us to be able to continue on in peace. Not that we were trying to convert her or anything. No one was to eating meat. But the same thing goes for us when we're having a discussion with somebody of a theological nature. You don't try to put a stumbling block in front of somebody. You develop a better relationship with them. And if God's a part of their conversion process now, then you may be able to say something that will plant a seed, but you will not make the growth of it. What did the Apostle Paul say? Hollow plants and I water, but praise and glory is given to God. Apollos is not converting people. Paul's not converting people. God's converting people, but God is utilizing these two individuals in their process in order to open the way to certain individuals, as many who are as appointed to believe at this time. Let's turn over uh, for one final scripture to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Uh, oftentimes we look at the book of James, we look at the book of Proverbs, and two things become very apparent. They are books that are pragmatic. They talk about life, real life, how to live life. James chapter 5, verse 19. My brethren, if any among you will stray from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he turns a sinner from the error of his way and will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. James is using the same word save or safe that is used by the Apostle Paul in the Greek, and it means to make safe. And you think about it, when we help someone to not sin, it doesn't mean that we gave them eternal life. Far from it. We didn't give them justification. Only the Father and Jesus Christ can do that. But we can help individuals through good relationships ones that are handled appropriately and we're not offending people or harming people, we're not hurting people, we're helping people. But an individual has to agree to avoid and has to agree to listen. And they have to, if we can help, we have to say it in the right words. I've heard some people say, well, you know, I'm just going to say it like it is. And if it hurts your feelings, then let the cards fall where they may. I've heard that from some people that with us. And I don't think that's the right approach. No, we shouldn't be just let the cards fall where they may. We should be careful with our speech. In the book of Proverbs, it references speech that's like golden apples. That should be what our speech is like. It's not rough and gruff and hurting people. And we shouldn't mitigate or demean people through our words, even if we're using God's words. I found this just to close with, and it's, it's, it's three different things to think about, about how we can become all things to all people like the Apostle Paul is talking about so that we might be a vehicle for which a person can be utilized to help, or we can be utilized to help and definitely not hurt. Listen is the first thing. This thing on this article I read said, we can often be too eager to share our own thoughts how many times have you seen that? You've been in talking to someone and you're trying to tell them something and you know they're not really listening to you because all they're doing is forming in their minds what they're about to say. They got something way more important to tell you than you have to tell them. How does that make you feel? What about when you do the same to someone else? You interject something and you haven't even listened enough to know what you're talking, what they're talking about, but you've got the answer for them right out the gate. Oftentimes that happens with salespeople. I got the solution for you, and I don't even know what your problem is, but I got the solution for you. And people use theology in the same way. 
You know, a common mistake is to jump into the conversation before you've heard what the person's saying. We appreciate being heard. And so we need to extend that courtesy to other people. We have to listen first before we become emboldened in our mission to convert somebody. Be kind. Being kind is very, very important as well. We should always, as a, as a Christian, an ambassador for Christ, be kind. But in, unfortunately, many of the most unkind people, crass with their words, sharpness of their tone, comes from, quote, air quotes, Christians. You got to get the last word in. You got to win that argument. You got to make sure that you told them exactly the way it is. And yet James tells us in verse 19 and 20 of chapter 1 that we are to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. How many times have you spoken out of anger and used the word of God with it? Just makes you think about it. And then finally, you know, we need to be sensitive. Um, we need to be sensitive to cultures. You know, we're living in a time for which culture is very different, very different from when I was a teenager and a child, and extremely different than maybe even my kids started out being right now. And it's not to say that you have to accept or approve of culture, but you have to be careful with the culture around you. You know, oftentimes people who are trained missionaries will go and they'll reach out, but they have to understand the culture of the people that they're getting involved with. We need to be the same. Not to say that we approve of it, not to say that we participate in it, but we need to be sensitive to it because one thing's for sure, if no one's listening, then there's no need to talk. And we can shut people's ears if we're not careful with this. We need to be discerning and ask for a spirit of discerning so that we can understand where we can be common and then where we can do the right thing. So just in conclusion, it should be our goal. It should be our goal to be non-offensive whenever possible. And the Apostle Paul was practicing a lot of self-denial so that he could gain a positive rapport with people. We need to be following in that example. And this way we might be able to help people. And, and he did it as well. And we may be able to allow the Father to work in an individual through your example your positive impression, so that then they can be pricked with repentance and turn. We don't compromise the word of God. We still live by it, but we're not offensive with it. And when we do this, we can be a tool to help others for the Father to save. 